Okay, ready? Lafia, Lafia. Lafia. Um, I just want to say that I want to take the opportunity to, to, um, how to say thank you for allowing me the opportunity to come here and interview the both of you lovely ladies. Okay. And I say that because um, it's not too often that we get a chance to try and begin to dispel some of the myths around this religion, this Lukumi religion. Okay, I call it Lukumi um, based on the knowledge that I have and how, I mean, I'm still very much a young priest. I have only have 16 years of culture. Okay, and to be able to um, be in the presence of my elders, and right now I'm directing that to you, Ia, because you are, to me, one of the pioneers of this religion. And I know that over the years, this religion has evolved in many ways, socially, politically, economically. Um, but even then, I mean, we look at the history somewhat based on the fact that um, in this religion, in this time, I know that there was a migration of peoples coming from, not only from Africa, but also from Cuba into Miami, into New York, into many of the other cities and um, states in the United States. And as they did back in, I'd say back in the 1940s after the war and in the 1950s after the Cuban Revolution, I know that, again, there has been a big change um, from then to now. There is an evolution. There is a change. And I really would like to understand, I mean, you said that you were excited just a little while ago about us doing this interview. And believe me, we are even more excited. We are more excited because it's giving us a chance to let everyone in the world understand, get a better understanding of what this religion is about. There's been so many myths. We're the chicken killers or what have you, okay? But to get it from the mouth of those who have experienced it is something that we have not had an opportunity to do. And we're taking this time, at this time, in this space, to get it from, should I say, the horse's mouth, okay? And I say that because you are someone who has lived it from the beginning. So, would you please, first, um, tell us a little bit about you, and then we will also speak to your sister, who's a little younger than you, but she also has many experiences and what the, I mean, she's been around, I'm quite sure. Yeah. You've been around for many years. So I would like to hear from both of you. Okay. Um, would you please, please honor us with telling us a little bit about you? Well, something that's fabulous and wonderful is that I was always interested in Africa and my beautiful race from when I was a child. I would say that I was about six or seven years old when there was a bimbe downstairs by black Cubans. We lived on the South Street, that's 124th Street. There was, they were really black Cubans and they had the black virgin, virgin de regla. And they told me, and when I first saw it, I just went off. I said, I was laughing and whatnot, what is that, what is that? I never saw a black virgin. And they said, that's Yemaya. They told me just like that. And they had several bimbes before they actually left. Uh, then when I moved to uh, Colonial Houses, which is now called Wrangell Houses, the people up on the same floors that we were had bimbes also. And they had a little Allegba head, which we didn't know was Allegba, but it was a little head. And we yelled, oh, look at that, look at that. And they said, well, that's called Cheeky. And oh, we just went laughing and whatnot. So those were my earliest experiences with the religion. My sister's early experiences with the religion, that happened with her when I brought a leg home. And I, I was very happy about that. I had gotten this allegra from a priestess named Asuncion Serrano, and everybody called her Asunta. And her, um, <coughs> she pre uh, got the religion out to everybody. Yes, Serge. Yes, I went to the temple. And his uh, things that he had, he told us about the religion. 
He let us know you don't have to kill chickens all the time. He let us focus on or the Orisha. He gave us positive images and truthful images of the Orisha. And something that he had that was excellent that they don't have anymore, a bembe every Friday night. And that meant you had something stable and positive to look forward. You would see the Orisha. You would meet the Orisha. So that's my, uh, like, b basically my early history. I was really brought into the religion. I think I got my first set of um, Aleke from Osa Onko. That's the name of uh, Asunta when I was 17. I didn't get my Ochame until I was 23. Meanwhile, in 59, I had just missed Serge. He went to Cuba. And this was up in a place they called Dambalawedo. That was Pianchi, and he, he was teaching the religion, and he was teaching dancing. It was all cultural. It was language, and it was dance, and it was emotion, and it was clothes. Extremely, extremely positive, and a lot of brotherhood and sisterhood. It was very beautiful. I never could give up the religion because at the time as a teenager coming into something so beautiful, there has never been anything that would make me not want to be in the religion. Then there was the first Ocha in New York City was done by Oban Yoko. She, her name was Mercedes Noble and she was a Jamaican Cuban. Number one, she was a black Cuban and she was born more or less speaking English because they were Jamaican Cubans. And her sister's name was Omile Foon, which is the name I have in Ocha. And she was also an Ase Soon, which is what the road of Yemanja that I had. And what happened with this is you could always go to Obanyoko's house. You could always ask Obanyoko questions. And she was real sweet, real loving. No nonsense, but very sweet and very loving. She's the godmother of Lionel Scott. Odufora, Obatala. He had made Obatala way before the other people were making Ocha. Now it is Serge that I have been to his house with his wife Jan. I was at Serge's house. That's Ofuntola, the man that founded Oyotunde. Because this is like our earliest roots, the dawn of Ocha for us. And then Asunta, which I have to give her credit because she took in so many black Americans and West Indians when all of the other people with the racism would not accept us and would not tell us the truth. She was breaking her neck, washing the house and giving us the baths and putting the leques on us and encouraging us to go forward and become priests. I'm trying to get the order of some of the people, the birth order. Now, it's old... Obai Lumi, that's Chris Oleana. And he's another person that his origins were not entirely in Cuba. His father came from uh, Curacao. So he was more or less born speaking English also. And his mother was Luisa Oleana, and up until the time he died, he had the same telephone as his mother, which is something very interesting. This just showed how stable he was, extremely stable person. He has one picture in the Guggenheim Museum, a collage, and he had another picture somewhere else. Anyway, he was into ballet. He broke his leg in Cuba. He was a classical male ballerina, and he came to New York. He was a genius. He knew all of the Odunes. He knew all, knew all of the abodes for them, and he also, when he was here in New York from time to time as a child, he was given readings in the Botanica. Now, Serge and Chris Oleana, Obai Lumi and Ofuntola were twins, and they were made in Havana in 1958. The next year, Serge brought um, Clarence Robbins Eshumiwa to Havana, and they were made over where uh, Ofuntala and them had been made. Now there's Jose Patapalo, Ibaye Baye Tunu, that somebody always mentioned because this person was important to them. And he's like a Lukumi that was involved in getting these people initiated. But then Obai Lumi 
The same year, a few days later, in September, brought Edward James, Shango Ilari, and Maria. Now, I can't remember um, Marie's name. Maria is a person like from Alabama, a straight out black American. Up until then, all the other people had some kind of exotic history or whatever. But this lady was a black southerner who really knew New York and she was a fashionable, very bright, uh, intelligent person, sophisticated person. Okay. So that's Edward and uh, Marie. They were initiated again as twins. Edward had this old doom called Ejila. And in that mm -hmm. old doom, they say, do not discuss things. Well, he would have these intellectual discussions and these comparisons which put people off very much and made people very afraid and sometimes made people ashamed of themselves. So he, ha he developed a lot of enemies, more enemies than he ever deserved. He was a kind, intelligent teacher. He was taught first by Chris Oleana, who was a genius, and had both of them had a comparative religion. Like it, you could give them a degree in comparative religion. That's how their minds were open. They knew Buddhism backwards and forwards. They knew mantras in from the Hindu system. They knew the whole Hindu pantheon, so they were able to match them to the Yoruba pantheon. And they would throw you a book, you know, like a, a, a book by Yogananda. They tell you you have to read this book. And they tell you you have to do pranayam. Both of them were like that. So hanging around them as a teenager, I learned a lot of things that other people didn't learn. I learned about a bad magic too because the people at that time were making a lot of money and this is not the religion by doing works and doing bad things so I learned a lot of bad things and because of that they had a nickname Caldero Mary okay so then uh, that's the first people that were actually made in Cuba then the next set of people, as I mentioned, Obanyoko made the first initiation in New York City was Mercedes Obanyoko. I remember the day they did it, but I couldn't go there, of course, I didn't have Ocha. All right. They went there, and it was a woman that she was made Shango. She was of Puerto Rican origin. And they told this lady that because you're pregnant with tri triplets, you're so lucky. Okay, they said, you're so lucky. She had a business, she had a botanica up in the Bronx. Well, she proceeded to have, they told her, don't argue with people again. She had an argument with someone, I guess her Ajibona, got hit by a car and lost the, the triplets. So part of why I'm saying these things, it emphasizes what you're told in Ita, what the Orisha tell you, you must follow it. These are the early beginnings again. So then the next person that I really want to talk about that was initiated in New York and I was there to their middle day because the person is made on Saturday, the middle day is Sunday, and Ita day is Monday. So that Sunday I went and there was Margie. Now I knew Margie before. I had been to her home and her little child was there, which is, um, let, I'll get back to that because sometimes my memory fault fails me. And I, the boy's walking around that. Now here's Aga, you made Joti. Joti. And he's a person uh, with great honors. He has his MBA. You know, he's, he's on the money. He was in the top uh, 10 percentile from Temple University. Okay, but he was a little baby like this. So then after he got bigger, big enough, they made her. And then he was put in the throne with her. And she taught me something called a throne wish, which I didn't know about. Instead of her wishing on her throne, because the throne is also an Orisha, she made a wish for me that I would be happy. And it worked. It really did. She was so kind and good. So anyway, that was the real beginning of black American Ocha. But again, she has uh, exotic origins. She is from Trinidad. And the next part of it is that she's a descendant of the Cokers. They came from Ghana. And somebody had kidnapped her grandmother and brought her grandmother 
to Trinidad as a slave. And this coker man, because the cokers were wealthy for selling copra, he got in a ship and he got some people with him and he ran it down till he found her. And he got her out of that situation. This is Margie. This is Margie's history and who she is. Shango Gumi. That means the sound that Shango makes when he comes down in the world. And I've heard it. It's a specific sound. And she does it. What happened was, when they told her that, she didn't know what that sound was. And somebody else had made the sound. She never knew it. But finally when her Shango came down, her Shango made that sound. So that is the, another proof of the religion. Now, Leonor, which, who was her godmother, looked exactly like a black doll. A beautiful, intelligent woman like Juana Marenque. Both of them could speak Lukumi, but Juana Marenque, which is the godmother of Penny, and the godmother of um, Betty Barney, now, I don't know Betty, Barnum, Betty Barney's Ocha name, but she was made Shango, and her mother was Oya. She's the first person that they made in the States that had the combination of Shango and Oya. She was working out at Westbury as a professor teaching culture and teaching dance. She got a lot of godchildren, which was very good for the positive spread of the religion. Meanwhile, Juana Monrique is a person that again, she's a full-blooded, really Congolese. And she had learned how to speak English because the Barbadian uh, soccer team, she was like a mascot of them. And she learned her English was absolutely perfect. But then when she got here, she went to another English class because she knew the difference between the English usage and American usage. That's to show you how bright she was. And she had a certificate in her home on a mantelpiece of that she had gone to for American English. By the way, also, she was Audrey Meadows' personal maid. So she had a lot of benefits and a lot of things she saw and a lot of things she did that other people just didn't have privy to at that time. Because now we're talking about maybe 1955 this was happening. Okay, finally, a boy missing anybody, but this is my personal. There are a lot of people in between. Now the people that initiated before me that are Yemen like this. In 1965 is Alfred Davis. Uh, Omito Ki. Yemanja, like water, has put me in a place of respect. That is also the student as well as he is the godson of Shango Ilari. One of the things I want to say is that there's a man that's alive and well today. That's Okikilo Nico. And I'm not going to say his first and last name for a lot of reasons because a lot of different people have the same first and last name. And I don't want any confusion of him with somebody else. I'm only talking about Nico Okikilo. Now, Nico Okikilo was involved, was the person that made Edward, and the person that made um, Marie, okay, he came into New York at some point, and he, he was involved in the two people that I initiate. I'm going to their bloodlines, because in Ocha we have what they call branches, as they call a Rama, and it's a branch of people, off of one big tree. Essentially, it's only two big trees, which is Fuche and another house, De La Pimienta, which I believe is part of Fuche. And it will come to my mind, this house, a huge house from Matanzas. Anyway, they have a house called the Shangos of Palmyra. That is Okikilo. That's Edward, and that is um, <coughs> Alfred. And then uh, what happened with that is Alfred was back, this is 1965, this is Alfred and Jan, the wife of Serge. These two people were initiated. And Freddie, which comes from Juana Manrique, she's like the first Obatala they made. These people were all made in Puerto Rico, which equivocates very much 
with the plants, the flowers, you could pick the herbs, the animals, everything, the atmosphere, being able to go to the river in a tropical water where you don't freeze. They were all made like in September of uh, 1965. Then the next year they came back and they made Sunta's uh, grandson and they made Beatrice. And I can say Beatrice Adderley. And she is of the Adderleys of the Bahamas. There's a street name for her uh, family and she's an heiress of that family. Now she ran a store for a long time, a camera store on Fulton Street in Manhattan because there's a big difference between Fulton Street in Manhattan and Fulton Street in Brooklyn. And this is again the same type of savvy of these Yamaya people, the early Yamaya people. And of course Beatrice is the goddaughter and the sister of Alfred and Edward was their teacher. Obanyoko had, um, not Obanyoko, I'm sorry, Uncle um, Asunta and Edward had classes for them as they were Yawos. Of course, I'd stick my head in there if I could. They told me you can't go in because I, I, I'm not, I wasn't initiated at the time. So now I'm trying to move on forward into some more people, some more things that are really, really important. Um, of course, Penny was made not too long after that. She was made in New York, again, by Juana Manrique. Because I brought up these people in the beginning and I continue on with them because as you reflect back, they're all related. I can't remember the year. Okay, I'm coming on up to 1968 when I was made. Sometime maybe two years before that, Nico was paid for to come from Spain. but Spain had a whole lot of rigmarole and Nico was forced to stay in Spain Okikilo stuck in Spain and that was bad for him because he wanted to come here okay meanwhile Polo came here who is my godfather Oche Gueye, the blood of the Orisha he was taught directly by Lukumis from Africa Apoto, L.A. Don, Belen Gonzalez, these are the same people I'm talking about. And they gave him secrets to the point that they told the whole Lukumi population of Havana and outer laying Havana, be made by Polo. We gave him all the secrets. One of the things that's extremely important is there is an actual ceremony to put a person on the mat for them to do Ita. And this was done to Polo. The man here, uh, Orestes Blanco, that what happened with him, he was doing the best he could. He took the crown of Oshun and he did as many ceremonies as he was told to give him the Ache, the blessing from heaven, to do the Itas. His Itas were excellent because I saw his Itas play out in this world. I've seen the children that had the Itas, the people that were pregnant when they had the Itas, the people that had the Itas and they were worn this, this, and this, and all of these things have panned out. There's, he didn't miss a step. So when Polo came, Orestes Blanco had had some setbacks, and so he came on along and he was fine. I cannot forget the day that I knew he was fine and he just looked at me and I just looked at him. We didn't have to say anything and he had that big beautiful wise Oshun smile and that was just something wonderful. Meanwhile my godfather and my godfather brother, this is, can only exist in a religious pantheon and this is Antonio Caramona, a Gwen Tolu, the goodness of the snail. All right, and then there's another lady, Jan, which was the wife of um, of um, Serge. Her name was a Gwen Leti. Yes, and that's her name. So anyway, there's a Gwen Tolu and a Gwen Leti. Anyway, these are these names, sacred Obatala names. All right. 
he got sick. This is uh, Antonio Carmona, and he was trying to come to New York. This is a very serious point that I'm teaching here. It's historical, but it's also a way to do things. He got sick, and it's me and my godmother in front of her, Orisha. She says, let's put pears. The Orisha said, put pears covered over with Efun in front of Obatala for a green tolu. And she was so afraid he was going to die, she was like in tears. I told her, nothing's going to happen to him. He's going to come here to you. He loves you. And that's true. So then, one night, about two or three months later, he came and knocked on the door. She couldn't believe it. She thought he was a ghost or something. She just couldn't believe. Nobody called or anything. Okay, here he is in the door. He said he was a shopping bag. The famous Cuban shopping bag. Everybody remember this. All the Cuban people came in with just a shopping bag. And what do they have now? Okay? And they have the religion. And the religion has a lot to do with why they have acres and businesses and everything. But they came to New York or they came to Miami with maybe just one Orisha and all of their Dilogun maybe around the neck. So anyway, he came on in. And meanwhile, Godfather, which is Polo, had told the family that Antonio Carmona is a national treasure, which there are several priests that are national treasures. And he was forbidden to leave the country. But just think about all of the powers, occult powers, or religious powers, and just plain uh, savvy that you would get out of a country when you're not supposed to leave and you're a national treasure. So that's to show you not telling people things and planning and doing your bow will get you anywhere you want to go. It really will. And if you haven't gotten the fame, the prom, the, uh, 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 the prominence, the fame, or the power that you want, it's because you haven't done it little by little, little by little. It'll get you where you want to go. So then, they're sitting up in the Ita of this man. And Polo's doing the Ita. Antonio Carmona is there, and so is um, Mercedes, I mean, uh, Orestes Blanco, the original Oriente of New York City. All of a sudden, Polo got a, a stroke. I'll just put it that way. But this is a stroke that was part of magic. And it went back and forth between these two men. I please tell you that if you know anything about uh, the religion and you have received Orishas, only love your brothers and sisters only send love because if you have any kind of hatred it takes effect as energy and it will hurt the person. So this stroke had gone back and forth between these two men. So finally they put Polo in the hospital. He didn't die then at all. Okay, and I was taking care of him. He called saying that I was Madrina, Madrina. He thought that I was Madrina. It worked anyway. We got him on out of the hospital. So then he goes to back to California where I was initiated. This is since I was initiated that he this event happened. Well, there's a man uh, named Jose Sardinas. They call him Cheo. And he comes from the famous line in the religion of the Sardinas family. And he was there. And so Polo said, uh, do an Ebo for me. I want you to do a bow to the head. Now this is yarmulke style, okay? All of the bows in the ocha go to here where the yarmulke goes, okay? He said, no, I've had a few drinks, I'm not going to do it. This other man thinks he's doing something, he jumps up and he does the a bow to the man. Then he got a stroke, he went to the hospital, and he's never been able to really walk or function ever since that happened to him. This is a big warning for everybody to know that the energy that is in the religion is real and powerful. And when you take on that power and you get the name of the Orisha, you have power. And don't forget it or put it aside, you have power. So anyway, of course, Polo came out of his crippleness when this was done, and he could function better. And fortunately, um, 
Cheo is fine because he had avoided the whole thing. I'm telling that story for a lot of reasons because it does a lot of teaching and also it's history. Now what happened with me that I'm so proud of is I made um, Daphne Dumas, who is also the god, the daughter physically of Anna. And our Anna Larimont is an excellent priestess and she's up and functioning. And what happened was my goddaughter was initiated in January. The mother didn't get initiated until like February sometime. So they wanted to put my goddaughter out of her mother's initiation and it was her brother initiation also. So anyhow, these things are historical because Anna Larimont is a person from Trinidad, Tobago, and she also had spent some time in Venezuela. So she had three sisters, two of which had tremendous, tremendous amount of Congolese and Yoruba retention. They can tell you about Sukanya, they can tell you about the Iamis, we call them, but the witches flying in the night. They know about the herbal things. If you want to talk about herbs, what happens is you don't have to go here or there. Just call up Anna and she'll tell you about herbs and the, the, the uses of the herbs. This is something she knew. Well, anyhow, uh, Daphne liked academia and she's very far up there. She's involved in um, one of the seven sisters, in other words, an Ivy League school. And she's on the board for one of the... Um, ecumenical uh, spiritual uh, organizations. She's on the board to, board to certify people to become ministers in that uh, area. So anyhow, in June sometime of that same year, I was honored to become the godmother of Barbara Bay. And it's Bay and Barbara, and people also think that they're twins, and they're not. Okikilo made Bay. Okikilo was crazy about Bay, and he was so happy to make Bay because Okikilo's secret is Shango. Okay, now the next part about Okikilo is that he had just come here, and he was having himself a hard time, and he was settling down. He was learning English, and he was learning that. He saw Bay. Bay looks like so many people that were in Cuba that were solid in the religion. And Bay had been drumming and whatnot and spreading the culture for years. But Bay is the opera singer. There's a picture of him in the tuxedo. And he had gone in Porgy and Bess, that was an opera, all after World War One, go with World War Two, going to England and all going to Germany and everything. So he's a friend of Leontine Price and blah blah blah. So anyhow, he had to come on into the religion because he said, it seems that when the people learn the culture, the next thing they want to do is be in the religion. So he went on ahead and he was being made. They were made the same day, but Bay comes from, and Bay is Ibaye, he comes from Okikilo, and Barbara Bay, Ogun Relekun, Ogun O Yemaya when she was Ogun's wife and they lived by the sea. She was a mystery all to herself. Ogun was her father. Ogun is her name and the religion. And she was so much Ogun and yet she was Yemanja. So anyhow, she had some very interesting Oduns, Oduns that the Babalaos are afraid of. She made a lot of people. The people loved her and she loved the people. When she died, it was like a hole was stared, torn in the sky. And we're only here recently getting over it. I miss her very much. I loved her very much. And she is a historical person in the religion because she made so many people. It's like Leonore made so many people. It's like Margie. Uh, Shango Guli made so many people spreading the light, spreading the religion and the people that were made went up and the people that were made they began to be themselves so many people got doctorates so many people you know got their agencies that they're over so many people went to school and became nurse practitioners something happened to the person a positive catalyst of the Orisha coming out of the person and the person being
who they are. So now I might be uh, forgetting a lot of the history and not bringing it. It may not be perfect, but it's the history as I remember. I must say something about Mama KK. I cannot remember who made her. I think she might have been made by Sumta, but she was a tremendous positive influence on the religion. And again, the Oshun people have a lot to do with keeping things right. If you're having an Ocha and you invite Penny, who's alive and well, thank the Orisha. What is missing or what's not correct? Oshun, this is Penny. Tell me her name, please. Uh, her Ocha name. Oshun Gweye. Yes, Warrior of Oshun. She straightens it out. And you, Nia, are the same way. And Mama KK was like that. Things have to be done right. And this is part of the role of the Oshuns. I'm trying to see if somebody else is coming up that I can remember. Somebody else is speaking to me now. Uh, Obai Lumi said, you said enough about me because I'm partially mediumistic. Okay. Uh, now it's Juan and Nelida because Juan is my uh, god brother. And he's one of the Lukumis that was told to be initiated by Polo. Uh, Juan was a full-blooded Yoruba, and he was told to be made by Polo, and it did him all the good in the world because being initiated, he was able to sneak away from Castro's men, get on the boat, and come to New York. Another story of uh, salvation and being able to reorganize instead of getting killed due to the blessings uh, of the religion. There's one person I want to re mention for femininity in the sense that there are female orientees and they are women that have enough knowledge that they can be orientees. And this is uh, Josefina Beltran. And her name is the same name, Olo Oshun Guere. Uh, and they named Penny after her. So now I feel that I would like for you to ask me questions because I feel that I've come to the last point of intelligent information that I could give about the history. Wow, that was quite a bit. That was a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful observation, experience, insight. Thank you. You know, um, I want to give you a little break. All right, thank okay, you. Okay, and, and ask your sister, your Shun to give us a little bit of, and you tell us about you. Okay, I'm, my name is Amanda Ross, uh, Janet is my sister, and uh, I'm an Ola Oshun, my name is Oshun Ioka. I have 11 years, I was made in 1994, but I'm the first person that uh, Barbara Kenyatta Bay put a leckes on, I'm the one that made her a godmother. I was her first, but I wasn't the first person that she made because I, I vacillated between making my ocha and not making my ocha for a long time. And But I finally made it in 1994, and I've only had positive experiences with the religion. And um, I love the, I have full faith in the religion, but they tell me to do what I try to do. And um, I'm working with Sabrina now. She's an old old shun. She's my Ajibona. And since uh, Ibaye Barbara, and um, I don't know what else to say. I I uh, I came alongside Janetta. She brought these things into the house. She had to really fight for her for her re her place in the religion because we were all Christians and we were against the religion. But she fought, and her her faith has kept true, and the religion has done a lot for her. And um, and then, I, but I was converted, and I have full faith in the religion now. And uh, I enjoy, I enjoy being an Osho. I'm surprised that I was an Osho, and I was marked so many things before I really made my Osho. So I guess it was really <coughs> time for me to make my Osho then, because Penny is, is old and wise, and she told me to play around with Osho for 15 years and see what what will happen. But the minute I, I think it took me. From two years when I was marked Oshun to make my Ocha. I didn't play around with Oshun. And uh, uh, my father's a light bar at mm -hmm. Yankee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very interesting combination. And there, there's so many Oshun uh, legbas now that I think they could start an egg bag. Is, is Oshun your, is the your father? No, oh, that's okay. a lot. Okay. But I know yeah. Legba is 
Um, Sabrina's got yeah, right. And, Col- and, and her and I are the same. We both call her and the father Legba. And there, there are a lot of little shoons who are like with their father, and it's a very, very interesting combination. You, you talk about being an interesting combination. I know that each Oshun that I know, being an Oshun myself, I see that not only do the roads of each Oshun give a specific character to the person who carries it, but when it's combined with their with their father, right. with another Orisha, then it it even makes it more of an impact on how that person turns out and how they respond and how they do right. everything in the world. But in your experience, and you ex- you said that Oshun and Elegba are a very interesting combination. How is it interesting as opposed to an Oshun, an Oshun with an Obatala or an Oshun with an Ogun or an Oshun with um, uh, Oya? Oh yeah. Well, one thing is Elegba's fast. And you and you can just put a name, or you don't have to give a leg of blood all the time. You don't have to have a big ceremony with any tie and four legs and everything. And so, with the with the lightness and sweetness of Oshun, a leg was fast like things that happen in the street. And it's just an interesting combination because people uh, speak of Oshun as being so la-di-da and fem fem but, uh, but Legba goes around in the trenches and gets things done and so you can have what I call it a tinkerbell with a sledgehammer <laughs> and, okay. and that's why it's an interesting combination because um, people want like to say Legba's devious and everything like that and that's true and sometimes you 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 have to be devious when you want to get things done, and it's just like I say, it's just a very interesting combination. If you observe who it, who these Alegba Oshuns are, it, you'll see what I mean. Mm, very yeah. interesting. Um, based on what you've experienced, where do you see um, where do you see this this religion as it's evolving? Oh, it's 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 gonna it's gonna take over with a light hand, not like uh, with, with a heavy hand like, like uh, um, the Muslim religion. And many uh, uh, people are going to come. Most houses are multicultural now anyway. They have, there's always one white girl in the house or something, something like that. And um, the, the people are educated now and um, the, the Orisha make a way for them to go to school when, may, when there may have not have been another way. We're, we roll with the times. We take, we've taken advantage of all the civil rights mm-hmm. and uh, the, the, the famous uh, issue is the house in Miami that got it where we don't have to uh, get rid of the animals anymore. We, well, we're safe to, to do our animal sacrifices so we don't have to worry about that anymore. And um, the re- religion is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and it's it's so intelligent. It's not uh, uh, it's not a heathen religion, and you know all the other disparaging remarks that have been made about the religion. It's 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 highly evolved, and it's it's volumes of information. It's a PhD in 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 religion when you know when you know the religion. And now my my sister her her expertise is the Odun's, but I like to do work. I'm not a math person, but if you you get me, I like to do I like to do grunt work. I was Archibald for an Oya, and I feel like I'm Superwoman because that's a tough job. And um, I like to go to Oches and do and really do the work. And my uh, Archibald was surprised. I don't know what she thought that when like when I, after I got the room and everything, and I was allowed to come into the ceremonies. She was so surprised at the way, the way I would just work. Everything was is my job, and I and I just love to partake and uh, just do do. I don't mind doing the grunt work, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. That's that's um, one of the characteristics that I find that Oshun do. Yes, okay. Oshun gets the job yeah, done. That's um, a characteristic. But going back, okay, when um, people in this religion, okay, we are looking towards understanding what the religion is about. Okay. However, there's still outside of this religion, people outside they have a very bad concept oh, yeah. of us, of 
this religion, they're talking about Santeros of Santeria. Oh, you're a part of Santeria? You mean you kill chickens and this, uh, you know? Um, as far as I can see, there is, a, is there a difference between Santeria and Lukumi and Yorba? Because you always hear these three terms. What do you see is the similarities, the differences? Are there any differences? Okay, um, it, it depends on how you come up. Now, I, my, my sister went to a lot of Mises and things like that, that the, the spiritual masses, I don't, I don't work like that. But I get things done. I, I get I get cars and apartments. If you want to work to get an apartment, come to me. I know the work. And uh, uh, Olo um, and Ogun just called me the other morning to tell me to thank me for the work I told her to do. But she finally got the car. And it's it's very simple things. And between a Santeria, Lukumi, and Yoruba, there is no difference. It's the it's the culture. The Lukumi is from the Cubans in the middle of Cuba, the black people, and the Santeria is because they had to cover up the name and put the saints, and it's a lot of, um, it's, it's a lot of modesty attached to it. It's just like um, a, a African Yawo won't wear as many layers as a Sant Santeria Yawo because it's hot in Africa. It's not that it's not hot in Cuba. But it's a different kind of hot. And if you ever observe a Yawo that comes from a really Santeria house and a Yawo that comes from a Yoruba house, it's, it's really, they're really very different. We still have to keep our heads covered, but the Yorubas get away from the shawl, which was perceived as something Catholic and nunnish and everything. And, um, but there's, but when, when it comes down to the, to the, to the real, heart of the matter. There is no there is no difference. It's the worship of the Orisha, those heads to whom we pray. And there's there's really no difference. Okay, you talk about the um practice. Yes. Um the practice and, or you you talk about the worship of the Orisha. Okay, worshiping the Orisha is one thing, giving homage and a belief in, in your heart and working to see the the greatness of the Orisha and how it manifests. But the um, practice may be a little different. Is there, in your idea, is it, how is there a difference in terms of its practice? Are the same rituals done in Yoruba and Santeria and, and, you know, and within the different factions? Or well, is there, again, is... Well, some of the things I won't know because I, I don't know what other people do in their house. But I, my experience was when I was a Yawo, I, work, I was working at uh, Columbia University's hospital complex up in Washington Heights. And there were some people there that didn't think I knew I was black. And when I came into the, when I was a Yawo, the religion came popping out of the corners. When I go to different offices as a Yawo, I got a completely different reception than I got when I was just a, a person working in, in the office and there are a lot of Latins up there and yes it is a little different but I can't tell you what they do but I know what, what I do and my house is Lukumi you know strictly Yoruba or well it's Lukumi and Yoruba is different but Sabrina says she's Luk she follows the traditions of, of the Lukumi and um, I, you know, I don't know I don't know what the differences are it's, it's, it's something subtle but there, but there are differences, aren't there? Yeah. Yeah, and I'm quite sure it depends on the area that you know it comes from. You know, like you said, in um, Yoruba, or in Yorubaville, should I say, or yeah. in Nigeria, you live a certain way. You're you have different types of herbs. You you know you have different types of foods. You have different language. You right. have different customs and cultures, things that you're used to. And I'm quite sure in in Cuba it's a little different. And now that we're here in the United States, again, there is also um, some type of difference. But one of the things that I would like to thank you. Okay. One of the things that I would like to ask your sister, getting back to to you, Ia, is um, some of the shaping factors of um, the religion may have come from other systems and other um, ways of practice. 
throughout the, the universe or universal ways of practice. I think that all religions come from one source, okay, and depending on where you live, whether it is in Yoruba town or in, in um, Timbuktu or in Turkey or Greece or whatever, it's practiced differently based on where you're from. But as that religion takes a shape in that area, it comes together as people come together and they move, especially here in the United States. But I know that this city, New York, is a very great city because I know that we have a melting pot of people and a melting pot of how they practice their religion. To you, Ian, mm -hmm. have you been involved with other types of religions or other systems or other practices of religion? And if so, give us a little information about that. Well, there was a man, Benito Chang, up at 182nd Street and St. Nicholas Avenue. And um, he ran a Cuban, he was a Chinese Cuban, and he ran this restaurant that was out of this world. So then, and that was across the street from where he lived. So then we had a friend named Detsy Wong, and um, she took us to a Buddhist master, a living Buddha. Well, when we're up in the living Buddha's house, here comes Benito Chang. So then one day, because they lived in the same building, so one day I'm going to the subway station way up to where they live. And here comes teacher out. And this was Dr. Wong. His name was Dr. An Bong Wong, and he was a living Buddha. Well, he gave me two initiations over my Ocha initiation, which is the Kuan Yin, because he came from Canton, and another initiation that is a form of the Buddha out of Tibet. And he had been to this ceremony where it's so similar to something else, okay? They put the saint on your head, the Buddha God on your head, and they put it here. And I said to myself, oh man, this reminds me of something, you know, like that. And so anyway, I got those two initiations from him. Then I got, uh, I came into contact with a Haitian family. I went to Haiti. And what it is, their Episcopal Haitian, Haitian Episcopal voodoo, as opposed to the Catholic voodoo. Mm. And what happened is, they took me right in, and I was supposed to be getting initiated by them. I didn't go back to get initiated, because first of all, I had to get a big permission from Ogun to go to Haiti. I had to have a goat killed. I, had, I promised Ogun that if he let me go to Haiti, he no, he told me, if you go to Haiti, you gotta kill a goat to me. Well, there was a little goat in, when I was living in Haiti, a little goat, and I knew the little goat, okay? They picked that little goat, and they took him over to the, uh, the voodoo doctor's house, and he really was a doctor. He was treating people with herbs and everything. He taught me several secrets, but what they did that was most interesting in this voodoo practice, the, all of the mambus and the important hongans said that I was a mambu already. And to this day, I have a granddaughter that is a mambu, and she says, why do you want to be interested in the voodoo? You're a mambu already. Mm -hmm. So that's my involvement in serious, deep involvement in two religions, not to mention two initiations in the Congolese system. You know, the Christian one, they call it, and the other one, Mayumbe, which is not supposed to be Christian, but it is. When I say that, they have a god named Sambi that's a cross. It's just like God Almighty up in the sky, the uh, solar part of God. And that's a cross, and they call it Sambi. And how you want to make your Nganga do bad things, you have to remove that cross out of there. In other words, take Sambi out of the little world that's in the Nganga. So technically, these are three religions that I've been deeply involved in, and I love them, and they love me. Because all religion is love and knowledge that you are a God. And I'm very much into that. And it's been very positive for me. That's my involvement in these religions. Interesting. I see you have um, artifacts of the Hindu religion as well. Um, I see. Is that Kali?
Bali, like you said, there's a Lakshmi. Right. Yeah. Lakshmi is, I'm quite sure, is different from Kali, but mm. I do have some some experience in that as well. But um, there are other universal religions or practices that I've heard you speak about, such as astrology. Oh, yes. Irawo. Irawo. Mm-hmm. That's Okay, when a Yoruba, in the deep Yoruba tradition, and there's a woman that taught me this, and she's a full-blooded Yoruba. When you're born in Yoruba land, and you're real Yoruba, when you're born, they do the Iraro, and it's a form of divination that's related to astrology. And they tell you your fate, and then if something's bad in the fate, then you go to the Bible out for the abode to be done. And uh, she taught me a lot of stuff. She taught me something that is so valuable, I want to mention this, because it's part of like the Iraro in a way. She had a very bad temper. And they said if you take water and you let it set for 24 hours, and then if you drink it in the morning, it will remove your bad temper. And it removed hers and it removed mine because my temper was, you know, really out of this world. Now getting back to something about the different pantheons, you can match them. You can match them. All over the world you can match the pantheons. Qigong is the god of justice and fighting in the Chinese system. Kartik, and that was like Kar, right? And he was in charge of the chariots of the uh, warriors in the Hindu system. Nobody ever talks about Kartik. But that's our Ogun. You know, just match, match. I was up in the Chinese system, that's interesting, and on the altar was Qigong. And they say, well, who do you belong to and whatnot? They put me to belong to the kind maiden, which is going back to Yemanja. And then um, there's a guy, a Greek guy, that's a friend of ours. He, We came in in our clothes to the restaurant. Oh, he just went crazy over us because he knew we're in the religion. And so then we had a long talking with him. We came to the conclusion. He said, we were talking about Demeter, and there's another god we were talking about. And he said, oh, yeah, I know this because he's a Greek. Oh, this is the same religion, he said just like that. Because you could put that Greek pantheon, and then don't forget if you get into Kabbalah, up on that tree of life, and up there in those realms, and with the different aspects of God, you can just hang it right on there. The whole thing makes sense, and it's so ancient. We remember the flood, the Chinese people remember the flood, the Hindu people remember the flood, and the Jewish people, of course, wrote about the flood. These religions are so ancient that we are really all one and the same, and that's, that's my experience. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, do you have any questions for for or any other things that you might want to speak of. I was about to say, do you have any questions for me? But this is not about me. Um, do you have anything that else that you might want to um, share with us? One thing I want to share is that there's a lot of things with certain type of fundamental Christians, people becoming fundamental Christians, people becoming uh, that they're against all the other religions, just Christianity or any religion that does that. When you go out in the world and you want to make Christians, always remember that everybody already knows about Christ. You're just finding out about Christ here and now. But all the other world knows that God is their Father. All the other world knows that we are descendants of God. And Christ said, And I say that ye are God's, and the scripture cannot be broken. And the scripture is inside of the Psalms and it says that we are gods. Your name for Oshun, your name for Yemaya, your name for Oshun, I'm named for Yemaya. When we took on these initiations, we became gods. And it goes just what Christ said. If a person wants to make people Christians, they have to remember first that the person is God mm -hmm. and that the person already has a revelation from their ancestors and whatnot that they are gods. And if they want to turn the world out of bride burning and these mutilations and different little bad things that these people do that they say we don't do, okay, they have to work with that. Because Christ said, and I say unto ye that ye are gods. 
And then his only commandment is that we should love one another. And as Yorubas, as Lukumis, as Santeria, we're crazy about each other. We all love each other. We really do. And Yemaya is the mother of Shango. Yemaya is the mother of Oshun. Shango loves and protects Oshun and Oya. The religion and the Orisha can never be taken apart and made to be one Orisha. So this is what we have to know is we as human beings, we can't be taken apart and say, well, this is the only one and this and that. We can't do that and we must love one another. That's my only message. Do you have anything else to say? No. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I thank you. Thank it has, you. It has truly been one of the most wonderful learning experiences that I've had between the both of you ladies. Um, something that... Um, I really want to begin to study even deeper some of the secrets that I know you both have. Okay. I'm um, Santeria 1968 at Hotmail. Okay. And I am going to put up a Santeria 1968.org. Uh, okay. Okay. Wonderful.